the others are so concerned about gathering clues and solving their own mysteries, they've completely forgotten about me. Relationships are like war. It takes logistics, discipline, and well-crafted strategy to win. I strive, I work, I train every day to solve the problems in my household, and nobody appreciates all my effort. You won't find me in the lounge or the billiard room. I'm a worker, and my time is spent in the cellar, in the kitchen, in the hall, organizing, repairing, fixing. There are no loose ends in my home. I do the same thing in my marriage. I, I draft up a communications plan, analyze all the relevant maneuvers, and confront conflict like a formidable enemy. Yet after all that, my wife blames me for our inability to connect. Her weapon is criticism, and she aims it at me, even though I'm the one doing all the work. <laughs> It's so unfair. I muster my energy, my courage, my moxie, and march into battle. And what happens? I get stabbed in the back. Well, today we're talking about general victim. And there is a tendency in all of us to play the victim. I can't tell you how many times my wife and I have been in the middle of a fight. In the middle of the fight, I turn to the victim card. Well, I guess I'm just a terrible husband then, aren't I? I guess I don't do anything right, do I? And she does the same thing. And so we both play the victim and try and emotionally blackmail the other person for feeling bad for bringing up whatever legitimate criticism they had. So all of us have a tendency to reach for this tool of being a victim at times, but others of us, it is our primary love language. It's the primary way by which we've gotten our needs met. Now, if you don't know what general victim is, you probably spent some time with them over the Thanksgiving holiday. I'll give you a couple examples of, of what some real victims look like. I was talking to a friend, uh, I'll, I'll call him Bill, he's with his wife, and they were hanging out with a relative, Wendy. True story, the names have been changed to protect the innocent. So true story, they came home and said, you're not going to believe what happened today. There was this horrible accident up, up north of Cincinnati. Apparently somebody pulled their car to the side of the road. And when they did, this person actually got out of their car and actually committed suicide. And it's just tragic. And, and things were backed up and I just can't imagine. And their relative Wendy said, well, I can't imagine if I had seen that. That would have ruined my whole day, maybe my whole week. Yeah, what about the person who died, right? A victim has an ability to make everything about how it's traumatizing them. Legitimate things and illegitimate things. When we were in college, I used to go for lunch every, uh, just about every day with my wife. She worked in the accounting department with several other accountants. And so we'd come and we'd be hanging out, having lunch together. And there was one particular friend who was a general victim. It didn't matter what the topic, it didn't matter what the subject, in two sentences, sometimes one sentence, you could figure out why it was about how they were traumatized. Man, I had a great day today, it was so fantastic, I'll probably never have a good day. Every time. It was like this person could hang out with you for five minutes and it felt like five days. Just everything was draining. My wife was uh, getting prepared, I proposed to her and she was going to head to get her wedding dress. So she invited this friend to go with her. Thought this will be cheering. This is exciting. Girls' night. She probably doesn't get invited out very often. So they they head over. My wife comes out wearing her wedding dress, so excited, standing there with all the mirrors. She turns to her friend, "What do you think?" And her friend says, "I'll probably never get married." No one will probably ever propose to me. My wife came home. She's like, I can't believe it. She couldn't even for 20 minutes, not even for 30 minutes, make it about me. Couldn't just celebrate or rejoice with me. Even for 30 minutes, she couldn't. So we've all been around general victims. And if we're honest, we've practiced this tool occasionally. I want to, just like we've done other weeks, try and have some empathy for why general victim has become general victim. And often it's because they've been victimized. So we're going to talk about, not in detail, but some of the pain of the past of being victimized by circumstances, by people, and how that has set up a pattern of brokenness that we can have a lot of empathy rather than being irritated and help those in our lives who are victims 
begin to move in a healthier way. Now, to do that, I mentioned in our series that that each week we've had a general principle. The principle here for the victim is that the victim, what, what the victim really needs to move forward, to, to find health, to, to move out of the, the victim mindset, is going to need two things. I'll put it up here on the screen for you. A victim needs to find an identity that's greater than their trauma. Whatever the trauma that occurred that sort of taught them this pattern of getting their needs met by being miserable. They're going to need to find an identity that's greater than their trauma. Because right now, the greatest identity they have is being a victim. And so everything revolves around getting their needs met by being a victim. And they need an identity greater than their trauma. And they're going to need a love that's greater than their shame. Victims have a real struggle taking responsibility for what they've done wrong in a relationship. Because they're so currently surrounded by shame, owning what they've done just brings more shame. And so they've got this invisible shame shield that keeps them from taking responsibility because I already feel bad about myself, and now you're asking me to feel worse about myself. They don't see confession as a way to make progress, and therefore they never confess. If you remember, some of the material for our series came from a book called How We Love. And in that, there's a website several of you said you visited called How We Love Backslash Core Patterns, where it shows our different characters and what they play. And what's interesting, if you go to the victim page, I pulled it up earlier, the victims, if you click on any of these, victim marries a pleaser, victim marries a vacillator, victim marries a controller, victim, almost every one of them says, doesn't really happen, doesn't really happen, doesn't really happen, except the controller. The victims often marry controllers because they didn't have a voice, they don't feel like they have boundaries, and they get into this dynamic. And here's what the pattern of a typical victim and controller looks like in marriage. The controller builds up tension. Non-compliance, you're not doing what I said, causes the controller to build up tension. They're rigid, they're easily angered, and they're deregulated. They're very frustrated that you're not doing what I want. So the controller vents. Having built up tension to a breaking point, the controller vents and rages. When a controller is uh, is threatened or stress is high, they tend to rent by by rage. The victim is now triggered. Oh my goodness, I've been treated bad enough. Now look what you're doing to me. Having learned to tolerate the intolerable during childhood, the victim attempts to placate the controller, but the victim has little or no voice in the relationship, and they're very childlike. While the controller escalates, detached from their own childhood trauma, the controller lacks empathy for themselves or others, and may become physically or emotionally abusive, they're likely to resort to addictions to numb their pain. The victim freezes. Following the incident, uh, the victim freezes or disassociates, they become depressed or detached, and may even threaten to leave the controller. Controller compensates. All right, all right, all right, right, sorry. He doesn't like the avoider's distance since it limits the controller's ability to monitor them. And so, apologize. This won't happen again. Never happen again. Uh, Sorry, sorry, sorry. But they never actually admit wrongdoing. It's a temporarily power shift where the victim becomes the controller and the victim becomes the, the controller becomes the victim. And then they start the pattern over again. So, this is a typical pattern that you can see in friendships, you can see it in relationships when you have a victim, specifically a victim, tied with a controller. So, before we dive into the Bible passage today that speaks about our victim, a woman by the name of Leah, I want to try and remind us of all of our characters. So to do that, we've got some uh, theme songs that we've been practicing here for the last, I guess, seven weeks we've been together, and try and guess which one goes with who. So, from the last six weeks, let's play the first one and try and guess which one of our characters this characteristic goes with. All right, who do we think that is? You remember? It's our controller. Everybody dances to that at weddings. And it's like, this is kind of disturbing, really. <laughs> every move you take, every breath you take, I'll be watching you. All right, what's our next song? That's our controller theme song. All right, you want to guess? Talked about him last week. This is our pleaser. This is my theme song. I, I want you to want me as much as I want you. I want you to please me as much as I want to please you. And we learned about that last week and, and some of those tendencies that are good and some of the real downside to that. All right, what's our next song? Why, then, 
everybody always picking on me. Why is everybody always picking on him? Who do you think this is? Our victim. That's right. Song we heard growing in. It's never their fault because, again, shame keeps them from taking responsibility and they feel like everyone's always picking on them. So it's hard to bring up conflict or bring up an area to change in a victim because I can't believe you would say something about that. How can you be so ungrateful? So just don't even need friendship, be a rock, so to expect less and avoid conflict. Just be a rock. People who need friendship, you know, that's maybe things that my wife needs, but it's not anything I need. And then our last theme song, won't be hard to guess which one it goes with, but here's our last one. So we learned about Jacob, who was a vacillator. And vacillator is just high extreme, emotional volatility. They go from things are great to things are terrible, and it can be very unpredictable. And often when they marry an avoider, which usually happens, it creates a lot of conflict. So these are our cast of characters we've been learning about for the, next, the last six weeks. And today, as we look at the general victim and how they associate with these different folks in families, in marriages, in companies, I want to offer you two truths about the victim And then three applications that we've done each week. And my hope is that if you are a victim, number one, I want to try and give a a lot of empathy to understanding something brought you to this place. And we want to weep with those who weep. And we want to enter into your story. And we want to teach that there's another way to get your needs met that doesn't always involve having to sort of emotionally blackmail people into owing you because you're a bad day. Because even then you would say, that's not really what I want. You want somebody to choose to give you attention and choose to affirm you and choose to encourage you. So there's a way to express your needs without having to always use, look how bad my day is or my life is in order to get those needs met. So as we do that, let's look at our first truth. Our first truth is that Leah, who's our victim here in Jacob's story, a victim is going to need to distinguish between being a victim versus being victimized. One is an identity while the other is actually an event. Meaning most victims came from chaotic backgrounds where they were victimized. It could be sexual abuse, emotional abuse, physical abuse. But there is no doubt that there was victimization that went on. And in that huge trauma came into your life. Sometimes you were victimized by circumstances. It was a divorce that occurred when you were a small child at a very pivotal time. It was the loss of a spouse. It was the loss of a child. It was, there was something in your life that that you would tell us your story and we would sob. We would just go, oh my goodness, I don't know how anyone would have survived that. And you've survived. However, instead of seeing that as a chapter, a tragic chapter, a horrible event in your life, it's become your identity. And what I want to share with you today is that the Bible offers hope that the victimization in your life can be an event and a dark, dark chapter, a dark week, a dark month, a dark decade, but it doesn't have to define you as your core identity. And Leah and Rachel were both daughters of Laban, and Laban was a scoundrel of a father who traumatized both of them, but specifically Leah. Jacob wants to marry Rachel, and he works for seven years to marry Rachel. On their wedding night... Because in the Middle East, they had their face covered. And it was a patriarchal society where the dad gave the bride away. Dad switches sisters on the wedding night. So he is enjoying his wedding night with his wife. And he wakes up the next day to find out he's with her sister. Imagine the trauma that your dad tells you that you need to marry your sister's boyfriend. 
I can't even fathom. This was a severe level of victimization that Leah faced. The dad says, I know no one would ever want you for you, so I'm going to have to negotiate a deal where somebody's tricked into marrying you and forces her into the bed with a man who does not love her. And here's how the passage reads. Jacob served seven years for Rachel. He says, hey, hey, give me my wife. I've worked my seven years. That's sort of my dowry. But instead, Laban took Leah and gave her to Jacob. Again, face covered, doesn't realize it. At the end of the wedding ceremony, it came to pass in the morning. He wakes up, hey, honey, and behold, it was Leah. (gasps) What happened? So he comes to Laban. Hey, what have you done to me? Was it not Rachel that I served for you? Why then have you deceived me? And you'll see this history of this father who just he deceives the whole rest of the Bible as well. And so he gave his daughter Rachel as a wife also. So now the father goes, well, tell you, work for seven more years and now you can marry both of them. Imagine the trauma now that you're married to your sister's boyfriend and now your sister wives with your sister and you didn't get along much to begin with and now you're in a household together. And now the same unlove she felt from her father Laban is the same unlove she feels in her marriage. Look what it says there at the end. He, her husband, loved Rachel more than Leah. So she grew up victimized, and now she's in a circumstance that continues that victimization. Painful, painful trauma. Painful difficulty. And because of that, three things happen. Number one, victimization, for most of us who've been victimized... You've totally lost boundaries. Somebody violated your boundaries. And so because of that, you don't have the ability to have boundaries or, or you, you have boundaries that react even to appropriate things because you think they might cross your boundaries. Victims often lose their voices because they didn't have a voice as a child. And they certainly lost an understanding they could be loved for who they are. As you come into our church, you don't know how many of us walk in the doors with stories of trauma. I remember when we first moved to, we first in our, our first facility over at Cincinnati Country Day Church, we had one of our good friends of mine, strong volunteer. And every time they'd come in, as I'd often do, I'll shake people's hand or I'd give a side hug, and I purposely give a side hug because of stories like I'm about to tell you. But even when I was shaking hands, every two or three times I'd shake hands with this woman, there was just an awkward moment. Not huge, but just a little awkward. One day she and her husband said, hey, could you stay after service and we want to talk to you? I said, Sure. So we came, we sat down at the table there at Cincinnati Country Day, and she said, I've never shared this with anyone but my husband, but I was was abused by my priest. And you represent spiritual authority now to me, and so I know you don't mean anything by it, but when you reach out to shake my hand, not all the time, but sometimes I relive the trauma. And I was just heart sick that me shaking hands could add trauma to the story. And I said, what can I do so that I, I, that I, I don't, I help with this and healing of this and not contribute to this? And she said, tell you what, how about this? When you see me, keep your hands down. And if I raise my hand to you, that means it's a good day and I'm okay with it. And so I became very sensitive to that for many years. And I so appreciated her inviting me into her story because I was unintentionally, just by saying good morning, causing trauma. A good friend of mine who influenced my understanding of the Bible and everything else is a man named Josh McDowell. He's sort of a a thinker who's written hundreds of books specifically on why the Bible is true and Jesus is God and the evidence, archaeological and manuscript otherwise for it. He came and spoke with us a couple times here at the church and the last time he came, he shared that though he's known for being the, the research guy on the Christian life, that he had actually been traumatized as a child by a relative. It came up because, it's sort of a weird thing Christians do, but Christians sometimes uh, will, will put a hand on somebody's shoulder and will pray for them. Hey, God just wants you to be with them. It's kind of a way of uh, almost putting your arm around somebody saying, we're with you and God's with you too. He said, well, if you pray for me, that's fine, but don't put your hand on my shoulder because that's how my abuser used to touch my shoulder. So victims, the reason we want to have compassion for victims is because they can be irritable, they can be frustrating, 
But when you enter their story, you find out there's a reason why this love pattern developed. And we want to have great empathy toward adjusting to try and step into the story. And if you are a victim, that event, that chapter doesn't have to define you. You can say, I was victimized, but I am no longer a victim. And that's the beginning of making progress. And Leah's going to find the same thing. But before that, she's going to develop a whole lot more bad habits. And our second truth is this. General victims learned a pattern growing up to have their needs met through misery. They learned this pattern. And so like in most clue boards, you've got the, the billiards room, you've got the library, you've got all these rooms that we all know about. The victim has added rooms to their board. They've got rooms in their daily living like the waiting room, the hospital bed, and hospice. And what they have learned is that the best way they get their needs met is they talk about why they're in the waiting room. Let me tell you about the health crisis I have. Let me tell you what happened to me. Let me tell you about how horrible it is. Let me tell you about... And those are often legitimate issues. But it's become the only way they know how to get their needs met. And it's wearing the people out around you who are like, you ever have a good day? Do you ever have a good day? My compassion tanks are empty. There are other rooms and there are other ways to get your needs met. I remember my wife and I, we were first married, 22, 24. We practiced a version of the victim tool, but we called it the resume exchange. Here's what it looked like. I'd come in the door. Hey, honey, how's it going? Oh, you're not going to believe the day I had. What happened? Oh, this happened and that happened. I didn't get to do this and this is broken. The dishwasher. Blah, 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 blah. Oh, my goodness. To which I, as a good, loving husband, did what? Let me tell you about my day. Oh, my goodness. Oh, I got distress and this deadline and this situation. Blah, 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 blah. Did either one of us feel connected? Now, we call it the resume exchange. I walk in. Here's my resume for why my day was bad. Huh, that's nothing. Let me show you my resume for how bad my day was. Oh, that's nothing. Let me tell you about this. Totally missing each other. And what we began to learn is instead of telling people how bad your day is, what do you really need? My wife would say, you know, I really just need you to sit down and enter into my world and tell me you care about some of the things I've been wrestling with today. She began to learn how to express her needs. Need for attention, need for appreciation, need for comfort. I, on the other hand, learned better how to meet her in those needs rather than dismiss those needs with my own resume of victimization. And what I really wanted was attention. Hey, I want you, let me tell you about my day. I don't need comfort as much. I want you to be excited about the thing. There's a big project I'm working on. There are a bunch of deadlines, but actually I want you to be excited about the things I'm excited about. And I started to learn, instead of using the victim card to get my needs met, how to express my needs so my wife could choose to meet them. She's learning how to express her needs so I can choose to meet them. And this is very hard for a, for a victim. It's very hard because you don't think, and it's not worth the risk of sharing what you need because they might not do it. There's a risk there. Versus if you emotionally blackmail them by telling them how bad your day was, how could any decent human being not show me attention and comfort and appreciation? But it's going to be part of the journey is taking a step from that. I remember uh, recently I had some friends who had a baby, and I, I, I saw them catching themselves doing this, and I was really proud of them. Because even having Quinn, eight years old, still in diapers, we still sometimes do this. One of the spouses said, oh my goodness, it's just oh, new diaper. Somebody's got to change the diaper. The other spouse said, I've already changed four today. I changed three and was up till two in the morning. Well, I... And they caught themselves. I was proud. They caught themselves. Hey, we're doing that thing, aren't we? Hey, listen, I'm delighted to serve. I know it's tough. I'll, I'll take the next half hour. So there are these tools, even in little ways, that we pick up. Rather than saying, hey, I really need support. I really need appreciation for staying up till two last night. Instead of talking that way and using that tool that I gave you the opening week to be able to express needs. What I really need here is acceptance. What I really need here is affection. I just need you to sit down with me and put your arm around me or, or give me a kiss or, or rub my arm and let me know that we're, we're in this together. Instead of expressing needs like I really use some approval here or blessing and just a reminder that you really believe in me or I really could use some encouragement or some comfort after the tough day I've had. So there's nothing wrong with admitting you've had a tough day, tough week, tough year. But there's a difference between expressing your needs and requesting it versus demanding it 
through this victimization tool. Now, let me show you how Leah, this pattern lasts for six children. She has more children than any of Jacob's wives for a very specific reason. We'll see why in just a second. She learned early on that misery was the way to receive love or to get her needs met rather than expressing them being miserable. She then applied that to God. When the Lord saw that Leah was in love, he opened her womb and Rachel was barren. So, so Leah conceived and bore a son and she called his name Reuben. And his name literally means God saw me when I was afflicted. So here's what she learned. She even names her first son. God sees me when I'm miserable. That's the name of her son. Yeah, they get worse. So her son's name, Reuben, literally means God saw me when I was miserable. And look what she says to herself. Now that I've been miserable and I've given a ch- child and I've gone through childbirth, now, hopefully, maybe, because I'm miserable, my husband will love me. It's in her affliction, God hears her. And it's in her affliction, she hopes her husband will love her. She learned early on that being miserable is the way to get her needs met. Now, God is going to step into Leah's life. It'll take six childs before she's able to get it. And he is going to, if you see the words used, God saw her. God heard her. And God is going to say, you have not been seen and heard. You've been victimized, uh, objectified. I see you for who you are. I love you for who you are. And he enters into her pain and does what, as we've talked about the secure love style, he recognizes and welcomes the needs that she has, full emotional spectrum, and she's got a bunch of them. We just see her kids' names. The parent is able to contain the child's needs, give appropriately to those needs, see them, hear them. The child feels loved. God loves her. Seen, God sees her. And heard, safe and whole. And that begins the process of her healing, is God seeing her in her trauma and beginning to move her forward. That he loves her in a way that her dad didn't. He loves her in a way that even her husband isn't. Next point. She learned that that misery, which she hasn't learned actually, that misery never satisfies. This tool the victim uses never works. You keep using it, but it always promises it'll work better next time. You've never, at the end of being miserable and people comforted, you've always wondered, did they just comfort me because I was having a bad day? I wanted them to give me attention just because I matter. See, she hasn't learned that misery never satisfies. It only promises it will next time. Look what happens here in the text. She conceived again and bore a son and said, Because the Lord has heard that I'm unloved, I'm miserable, he gave me another son. So she called his name Simeon, which his name name literally means God saw that I'm unloved. She conceived again and bore a son, and she says this. Now look, second son. Now this time... It didn't work last time. Now this time, my husband will become attached, because he's not yet, to me, because I went through child labor again for him. And his name was Levi. In fact, what we've been studying in this passage, in this series, has not just been the Bible, but also the newest literature in marriage and family. It's called attachment theory, or attachment literature, the research on how we learned our attachment. That very phrase is used here. That if we don't learn how to attach securely in our, from our parents, we will have this void in our life that we're longing for that attachment. We're longing for love. And if we don't have good skills to get those needs met, we come up with the bad skills. And Leah has that. She uses the exact phrase. Maybe if I'm miserable enough, maybe this time it'll work. Maybe this time it'll satisfy. Maybe this time he'll become attached to me. But it doesn't. And he doesn't. Misery never satisfies. So where does that leave us and how do we move forward? Well, I want to give you three applications. Application number one, to use the magnifying glass. If you're married to a victim or you have a child who has a tendency to be a victim, your tendency is dismiss all that stuff. Ah, stop whining, stop complaining, stop, you know, just be happy. How has that worked so far for you? It doesn't. Because the magnifying glass is when you most want to step away because it's kind of irritating and annoying is when you most need to zoom in. You need to enter into that pain. 
You need to show them that you care about their needs. You need to show them. Now, you, you, you resist it because you, you feel like you're being emotionally blackmailed into doing it. And so you pull away, which makes it worse. Instead of saying, no, even though this isn't the best way to express it, I need to actually get near. Show them their love for who they are, not what happened to them. The Lord was surely, is what Leah says, the Lord has surely looked on my affliction. And now, therefore, my husband will love me. He has another son, by the way. She said, because the Lord has heard that I am unloved, he has therefore given me another son. And she conceived again and bore a son and said, now I will praise him. So it takes six sons. And she goes through the different sons' names. I'll give you the rest of them in a second. It's at the sixth son we get to the word now. Now she begins to see having kids is not the way to get her needs met. (laughs) Imagine the damage she's doing to her kids. She finally comes to the place that she finds an identity greater than her trauma. That there is a God who made the heavens, who has loved me, who has seen me, and I can find an identity, not what's happened to me, but my identity, my core identity can be in who made me and who loves me for who I am, not what happened to me. And so at the end of her last child, she stops bearing children, it says. And now, finally, she finds this new identity. I will praise the Lord. I will find my identity in Him. I will be loved by Him. I will choose to believe He can love me even though I can't love myself. I'm going to choose to believe He can forgive me even though I can't forgive myself. She begins to process this through praising God and finding this new core identity. Second, Extract the poison from your pattern. There's a certain level of poison. The shame from the past needs to be extracted. And the shame from your love pattern needs to be replaced with a new way of expressing things. Now, Leah, it's interesting. Whether her circumstances are good or bad, she always felt like a victim. There's times in the story that she's able to have kids and her, her, her sister, Rachel, can't. So she's actually one up. She's got the ability to have kids. And even when her circumstances are up, she feels like the victim. Yeah, but she still loves Rachel better than me. Then, a few chapters later, she's not able to have kids, and and Rachel is, and she feels like the victim. So whether her circumstances are up or down, she's always the victim. And this is going to require an incredible amount of self-awareness. And it's going to require you to start realizing, everybody else sees this around me. But that shame shield you have around you keeps you from seeing it. You really see these isolated events that the whole world's got a black cloud over you. Instead of saying, well, you know what? When will I choose to find an identity and a pattern that is not tied to my circumstances. When am I going to choose to be happy? I'm 40 now. I'm 50 now. I'm 60 now. Will I ever choose to enter joy and to take responsibility for my own joy? And that's going to require you to extract the poison from this pattern that's occurred. And that's exactly what happens here. Because look what happens with Rachel and Leah. When Leah saw that she had stopped bearing, she took Zilpah, her maid... And she gave her to Jacob as a wife. I can't have any kids anymore. Uh, Sleep with my wife. I sleep with my maid. And Leah's maid, Zilpah, bore Jacob a son. And Leah said, and here's one of these names, a troop comes. Now I got a whole nother baby-making machine here in the family to represent me. So she names him Gad, meaning a troop of children are coming after this. This is going to work. And Leah's maid, Zilpah, bore Jacob a second son. And Leah said, I am happy, for the daughters will call me blessed. And again, you see the future tense of this? I will be happy. It will happen. Eventually, they'll see. So extracting the poison is you're going to have to notice this pattern and say, this hasn't worked for two years, ten years, twenty years. It's not going to work. I need to find a new way of expressing my needs. Because their daughters are not going to call you blessed. In fact, if you're a victim, you think the daughter's been talking about you the whole time, and quite frankly, the daughters probably aren't talking about you at all. The kids' names so far, by the way, all six of them, God is judged, I've wrestled with my sister is one of the kids' names, an army is coming, and I want people's approval, which is this one here. Secondly, just because something works doesn't mean it's healthy or godly. And the problem is, in, in one sense, getting attention through being victimized works. You walk in and say, let me tell you what happened to me. And immediately people go, oh, wow. So victimization works. 
But just because it works doesn't mean it's healthy or godly. And here's what happens. So Leah has just decided she can't have children anymore. She is going to give her maidservant Zilpah to Jacob, the vacillator. And she's going to think God thinks it's a good idea. Here's what it says. God listened to Leah. Here he is again, entering her story, magnifying, stepping into her pain. And she conceived and bore Jacob a fifth son. And Leah said, here's the name of her her son. God has given me my wages because I have given my maid to my husband. So she named his name Iskar, which literally means God wants us to give our maids to our husbands to make babies. Now keep in mind, when you read the Bible, sometimes it's descriptive of how Doug dysfunctional people think it's not prescriptive on how we should think this is a descriptive not prescriptive passage but it shows a very keen insight you do something wrong long enough and you will eventually tell yourself it's healthy you can even get to the place that you can do the most dysfunctional thing and think god wants you to do it and i see it all the time in people's lives God would want me to do this. Really? Because that's destroying your marriage. Yeah, 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 but God want me to be happy. Okay. Well, you know, I had to lie about that. And what happens is, because victimization works at one level, because it works, you think it's healthy. And because it works, you think it's... it's, you, You take verses like, mourn with those who mourn and weep with those who weep, and you sort of baptize your dysfunction in certain verses and ignore others. And the only way I know that I've seen people who've been victimized make progress is to really understand that God will enter into your story and into the middle of it. I was talking with a a friend a few weeks ago who's been through a lot of trauma. The trauma is related to a family situation. There's no uh, emotional, there's no sexual abuse, but horrible emotional abuse and narcissism and just trauma. And as I was talking to this husband and wife who both been through it, I said, I'm not sure you guys realize how much trauma you've been through. If you look at the stress scores on divorce, on moving, on the death of a spouse, I mean, these are traumatic events. I said, you guys have been through a lot of trauma. And you're trying to sort of move on as if nothing's happened, but God wants to enter into your trauma with you. We talked for a while together, and I prayed this prayer. And as we got done praying, they said that was so meaningful. I prayed something like this. I said, God, will you help this couple realize they're not in a cave. They're in a tunnel. And that tunnel is long and it is dark, but you are there with them in that tunnel. And unlike a cave that doesn't ever have a way out, it just gets darker and deeper, tunnels are going somewhere. There's a light And God, will you lead them through this chaos and lead them through this darkness? Will you grieve with them as they grieve? Will you comfort them as they need comfort and meet them? Amen. And that metaphor of a tunnel versus a cave was so helpful because victims always feel like they're in a cave that's getting deeper. And I want to encourage you that your cave can be turned into a tunnel, that God will walk with you through that tunnel of chaos. I had a good friend I was baptizing when I was in my 20s. As we were going through her story and why she wanted to get baptized, she said, it's finally time. I'm finally beginning to deal with the trauma of what happened to me when I was victimized in college by a Christian leader. And we wept together. And I said, what's brought you to the place that now you feel like you want to go public with your faith in God? She said, I had a dream. And this dream was so profound She said, in this dream, I was sitting in the corner the night it happened. In the dream, everything was dark, and I was curled up in fetal position in the corner, just weeping. She said, it was like a camera was aimed at me, weeping, feeling alone, feeling like nobody mattered. And it was like the camera tilted just to the left, and I could see Jesus. sitting next to me, weeping with me. And I just sat there in that dream, realizing that God mattered. I wasn't alone. He wasn't punishing me with this. He was with me in that moment. And that was so profound to me that God would enter my grief, that he would enter my pain, that he would be with me in my moment of of greatest loss and darkness. 
that I want to go public as part of my healing. I have distanced myself from God the way I've distanced myself from men. And this is the beginning of my journey back. Because I've met a God who doesn't just watch from a distance but enters into my pain. It's one of the most profound baptisms I ever did. And if you want to make journey in this, if you don't want this issue to plague you for the next 10 years, 20 years, because it will, if you don't make some decisions, you're going to have to spend some time in the study and in the library. You're going to have to learn, if you're you're married to a victim, how to use those listening skills we've given you because that person needs you to enter into their chaos. And most of us are terrible listeners. We've learned that in the series. We're both mostly terrible listeners. To learn how to listen and dig into that story. You want them just to get over it. Well, the way to get over it is to go through it. You can't avoid the tunnel. You have to go through the tunnel with them. To use that, those listening guides we gave. You can get those on the website, horizoncc.com, get a clue. But to enter into that story and to let them know you care and they're loved and they're cared for. And if you are a victim, you're going to have to spend some time in the library getting quiet, realizing that taking ownership for what you do wrong doesn't have to bring shame. In fact, owning what you've done wrong is actually the way to freedom. But you've assigned shame to it and say, I'm not going to feel more of that. Versus, no, 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 if I admit that and somebody says they forgive me, it actually builds you up doesn't tear you down. You only see step one, but there's two more steps that actually can build you up. So you're going to have to spend some time in the study and in the library studying this in order to break that pattern. And here's why Jesus is the perfect example of this. It's just so unbelievable. Jesus was victimized like no one in human history. (laughs) Scourged on a scourging post. Crucified with railroad spikes pounded between his wrist bones. Spit upon, mocked, punched, crown of thorns. And yet Jesus, though he had been victimized, is not known as a victim. He chooses that that was part of my story, but I am known for my resurrection. I am an overcomer. I am a forgiver. I am a server. I am a lover. And I know what it's like to be victimized. I'll tell you, I have been there. I saw my my cousin be victimized. He got beheaded by, by Herod. I know what it's like to see a friend be victimized. I know what it's like to personally be victimized. And so I can enter into your pain in a way that no one else can. But better than that, I can lead you out. And you can be known like I am known, not for my crucifixion, an important part of my story that shaped me, but known for my resurrection, which is why the Bible says that when you become a follower of Jesus, you get a brand new identity. And that new identity is you are known for what Jesus did for you, not for what you did or didn't do for him. You're known for what Jesus did for you, not what was done to you. Wouldn't you want an identity like that? And it takes practice. First to believe it, that you're loved, that you're not damaged goods, that your yesterdays don't determine your tomorrows. And then to daily, the Bible says, to put on that new identity, to put on this new loved identity that I am loved because Jesus was victimized for me. And God now loves me. Hear this. God loves me just as much as he loves Jesus. And that is the main message of the Bible that you can be loved for who you are let me pray to that end if you want to pray with me and just invite that spirit and whether victimization is a small tool or a big tool let's confess it God forgive me for using victimization to get my needs met But God, I'm hurting. And I've been hurting for a while. And I need to know I'm not alone. I need a God who enters in and comes near. God, I invite you to come and understand me. To sit with me. To grieve with me. To mourn with me that through that grief and through that mourning, Father, I believe that you died for me 
and I believe that you love me and forgive me even more than I can love and forgive myself. And I choose by faith to put my confidence in your view of me, not my view of me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks for being here today. If you came in today and uh, are going to be coming to our Christmas Eve service, I just want to mention two things on that. Uh, Giving Tree needs to be in by next Sunday. And lastly, uh, Christmas Eve tickets start now. They are ticketed events. We have eight services this year. And so if you want to grab tickets, make sure you have those for our eight Christmas Eve services out by the fireplace and the Christmas tree. Thanks for being here today.